Welcome to African Roots, brought to you by DW. In this podcast series, we discover how individuals from across Africa shaped the continent. I'm Kai Nebe. And I'm Leila Johnson Salami. So far in African Roots, we've spent a lot of time on politics and how they shape their country's trajectory. But equally important is their impact on music and literature. I am so glad that we can explore this, Kai, because I'm sure you can hear I'm really excited about my character today. And not just because she's from Nigeria. Well, okay, that's that's a start, though. So it's a she, right? So tell me more about her. Well, Kai, whatever you're imagining, she is more than that. Okay. This is a woman who words honestly simply just don't do her any justice. I'm talking about a giant of African literature, the one and only Flora Nwapa. So, so let's, let's start at the beginning. It's 1966. And Flora Nwapa's first novel, titled Eferu, has just rolled out of the printing press. She becomes the first African woman to publish a novel in the English language, as number 26 of Heinemann's famous African Writers series. But that was just the start. Wait a minute then. Florin Wapa is the first African woman to publish a novel. And how, how old was she at this point? That is correct. You know, she was born in, 19, in January 1931 in an area called Oguta in southeastern Nigeria. So she was 35 at the time of publishing. Now, apparently, um, she had spent a lot of time in her mother's sewing shop. And the time that she spent here really inspired her because she used to listen to the stories that customers would come in and tell. Now, Flora Nwapa was also educated at one of the most prestigious universities in Nigeria. The University of Ibadan probably was the most prestigious university in the country. Side note, Ibadan is actually where <laughs> I'm from as well. And then she went on to study at Edinburgh University in Scotland. But Kai, it's, it's more about her stories and what her stories were about that really sets Flora and Wapa apart. She's the first publisher in terms of a novel being published in English. And that's why, for me, I described her as a matriarch of feminist writings in Africa, as a matter familiar. That's Dr. Azumurana Solomon Omashola of the University of Lagos. He's a specialist in African and African-American novels. So in that light, we can describe her as the mother. And I believe there's no other female writer that qualifies for that appellation apart from Flora Wangba. Okay, Leila, so what is Ifuru about? I mean, I get that it was an iconic moment, it was a, a first, but is it an autobiographical piece? What's actually inside the pages? So Ifuru is the name of a brilliant, beautiful female protagonist who, despite her abilities and also her sincere loyalty, is castigated because she can't conceive and doesn't fulfill the, and I quote here, the traditional female roles, right? And this was truly groundbreaking stuff, Kai, because even the pioneering male African authors did tend to confine African women to the household. So, so Flora and Wapa really did the opposite with her female characters. Mm, but, but again, it, this wasn't just a different style. Everything that Nwapa did was as a pioneer and definitely went against the grain of what many thought was appropriate. Dr. Omashola again. Our objective is to present a counter-narrative to male depiction of women. You know, in the traditional African sensibility, women are supposed to be docile. They're supposed to be submissive. They're supposed to depend on their husbands. But in all our narratives, we have women who are independent, who even provide the financial muscle for their husbands. So here, for the very first time, you have a writer advocating for women's rights and challenging unfair cultural practices. However, Kai, while she was writing at least, Flora Nwapa never claimed that she was actively trying to write feminist literature. Still, Leila, um, surely her writing and the characters that she was creating, she must have 
provided at least an empathetic voice to the cause of women, right? That's pretty much the entire point. I would say that that point is especially crucial, Kai. Just like in, in her days, we had issues with um, widowhood, childlessness, inheritance, and all kinds of tradition that are really, really are harmful to women. That's Nigerian women's rights activist Betty Abba. She believes that Nwapa's books have had a remarkable impact on women's rights. Just the way she projected it in literature, in real life we have continued to give voice to those agitations that women um, should not be subjected to harmful uh, tradition. Women have a right to inheritance. Women should not be subjected to dehumanizing treatment because they are not able to give birth. But Kai, that's not all. So... A decade after Eferu was out, Nwapa, Nwapa became disenchanted with her London publisher, Heinemann. But did that actually end up ending her career or what happened next? <laughs> Absolutely not. It just made her break through another ceiling. So she went on to found Tana Press, a vehicle for her own work and those of other writers too. And so she became Africa's first female publisher. Flora's influence on subsequent female African writers was remarkable, according to Amashola. She seems to be a precursor of what most women are writing about now, in that she has given birth to other female writers. So she's a trailblazer that other female writers are following. So she has achieved so much. She died in 1993. And up to now, we are still celebrating her. So I see contemporary female writers trying to replicate what Umwakpa has done. Wow, that is quite a legacy, it seems. It, it sure is, Kai. And you know, that's saying plenty for a country that's produced writers like Buchi Emechata, Ifoma Okoye, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, and also Chibundu Onuzo. So you can see here, I mean, Nigeria does have a storied history with writers. That's a fact. And it's certainly one of many things that I can say I'm proud of as a Nigerian. DW African Roots. Find new African Roots episodes on dw.com slash African Roots, Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you get your podcasts. This is African Roots. I'm Kai Nebe. And I'm Leila Johnson Salami. There's somebody I would also like to introduce you to. And first of all, I'd like to invite you over from the Gulf of Guinea to the Indian Ocean and specifically Zanzibar, where a music had a once-in-a-generation talent. And no, I'm not talking about rock star and queen singer Freddie Mercury here. You mentioned Zanzibar. I must say that's one country on my list that I have always wanted to visit. You mean for the beaches, the sun, what? Well, absolutely. I mean, those two things are like my favorite joys in, <laughs> in life. Uh, so yes, and I will admit I was a bit of a Queen fan and I do enjoy knowing its lead singer, though from an Indian family, was born in Africa, sort of. <laughs> yes, but Zanzibar's music tradition is very rich and it's specifically famous for a genre called tarap. And if there is one person who really put this island's musical heritage on the map, it's Siti Binti Saad. Oh, that's a pretty cool name. And not just a cool name, but a massive talent. Kai, just one question, though, before we do continue. Uh, tell me, what is Tarab music? Well, it's a genre that began towards the end of the 19th century in East Africa and was credited to the luxury-loving and apparently music-loving Sultan Said Bagash bin Said. It's a musical genre that draws musical influences from Africa's Great Lakes region, the Middle East, the Indian subcontinent. And at its core, Tarab was poetry sung over Arab melodies played by an ensemble. <laughs> It is beautiful, so I'm guessing that Siti Binti Saad grew up listening to Tarab. Well, maybe, but it would have sounded very different. Initially, because of its association with the Sultan, uh, Tarab music was considered an elite genre and sung only by men and also in Arabic. 
Okay, so I'm I'm pretty sure this is about to get interesting because Siti Binti Saad was a woman, right? She was a woman and she was also not part of the elite. In fact, she grew up quite poor. She was born in 1880 in the village of Fumba on Zanzibar Island. Which is off the coast of Tanzania in the Indian Ocean. And she had no formal schooling. She, at the beginning, didn't even speak Arabic. She was just a young woman in the street selling pottery to make ends meet. But she had this incredible voice that carried. And apparently, legend has it, she actually sang to attract customers' attention. So tell me the story of how she then, can, can I say, moved up from this? Quite an unusual one. You see, Siti moved to Zanzibar town in around 1911 and began working with musical groups that, despite the taboos regarding men and women, making music in the same space. They apparently just couldn't ignore her talent. She had a very beautiful voice, very powerful. She could easily capture the audience. That's Mayam Hamdan, a music journalist from Zanzibar who studied City's career extensively. So, Kai, you said that Tarab music was sung in Arabic, right? So I'm guessing she still had to learn Arabic. Indeed, Siti Binti Saad actually had to learn Arabic and she gained fame by singing at Islamic recitals. And eventually Siti Binti Saad, the girl from the street selling pottery, sang for the Sultan of Zanzibar. And this is her voice. Damn, that hits. I mean, that sticks with you. But... Kai, does that sound Arabic? Not quite, Leila, but we'll get to that. <laughs> so Leila, City's career really takes off now. That record you just heard is called Wewe Paka, one out of many, many songs she recorded during the 1920s. But the story of why we have her voice recorded at a time when music was rarely recorded full stop, let alone in Africa, is because Siti Binti Saad was so popular. I am loving this, Kai, I must say. Okay, tell me more. By that time, Zanzibar was under British colonial administration and word had gone around of this mesmerizing singer. So the British gramophone company, and yes, that was a thing, decided to record her. I'm guessing in Zanzibar. And you'd be wrong. There was no sound recording studio in Zanzibar, so they invited City and her bandmates to what was then Bombay in India. They produced over 250 songs and sold over 72,000 records between 1928 and 1931. By today's standards, that may not sound like a lot, but we're talking about a very niche geographical market and a language at a time when it was hard to reproduce music and let alone sell it. So when you factor in all of those things, that number suddenly becomes a lot more impressive. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it seriously does. I mean, when you factor all of that in, that's like, wow. <laughs> But again, according to Mayam Hamdan, Siti Binti Saad's legacy is not actually from the sales of her voice, but what she used her voice for. She used Kiswahili prominently. And the songs which she composed directly touched the people's heart because uh, they talked about their daily problems, their needs. For example, she talked about the women, how they were abused by men, and then he talked about the government, especially the legal system. Ah, so that song that we heard before was actually sung in Kiswahili. And most importantly, that touched the hearts of the ordinary people where City lived. So by now, City was also composing, I'm guessing. Remember, when City started, she wasn't even literate. But here she is, in a very patriarchal society, using her songs to highlight the plight of women and the poor. She would perform for Zanzibar's sultan and the elite, but also regularly hold these free shows where people could come and listen. And because local people on the Swahili coast could now understand and actually relate to the music, City's popularity really grew. And just to give you a geographical idea of what we're talking about, it wasn't just Zanzibar, it was the 
coast on Kenya, Tanzania, spreading all the way up to the borders of the Democratic Republic of Congo. She was like a newsletter because uh, she was singing what the people wanted to hear, what the people wanted to tell the system at that time. Yeah, Sissy sounds like a badass. Definitely my kind of person in history, Kai, I must say. (laughs) The definition of a badass. Every rule that Tarab had, she broke it. And by the time Siti Binti Saad passed away in 1950, she had actually reinvented Tarab from an elitist male-dominated genre into music for everyday people. And and, and the, I still find this amazing. You had a musical genre that was male-dominated whose biggest star ended up being a woman. <laughs> Siti Binti Saad's music still lives on, and quite frankly, it's still the standard repertoire of many Tarab bands in East Africa. In Radio Zanzibar, they sometimes play her original song, but also many groups play her songs. Then she has a very beautiful song because it's like a cocktail, Arabic, Indian, African. Wow. But, you know, Kai, it also sounds like she gave Tarab, you know, a sort of political tone. I mean, insofar as bringing topics affecting women to the fore. Yes, and I I think that in this way, she's actually a bit similar to Flora and Wapa. And despite, obviously, their different fields and their different time they occupied. I mean, obviously, she couldn't go out and uh, say things explicitly. But the very fact that she was performing in the way she was doing and the tweaks she made to Tarab, I think you're, you're completely right. She she did in some way give Tarab a political tone. Absolutely. I, I can see the similarities as well that you draw between the two women, phenomenal women that we've introduced today. And Siti Binti Saad opened doors for more female Tarab singers, like Zanzibari star Biki Dude, who in her own right became a huge star. And when she started her musical career, all of this that she did was kind of considered unthinkable. So if Florin Wapa, right, is called by so many people the mother of African literature, then I guess it's fair for us to say that Sissi Binti Saad is definitely the mother of Tarab. Well, don't limit it to just a Tarab. She's even been called the voice of East Africa. Now, Kai, I must say that's a title that I am all for. That's unfortunately where we will have to leave things today for African Roots. This is a podcast produced in cooperation between Deutsche Welle and the Gerda Henkel Foundation. Special thanks to our producers, Thomas Schmidt, Maya Brown, Philip Zantner, and our voiceover artists. Contributions by Sam Olokoya, Aud Gensbittel, and Salma Said. I'm Kai Neber. And I'm Leila Johnson Salami. Until next time, bye for now. African Roots.